Angel is brought to you by LinkedIn. You already know LinkedIn as the world's largest professional network. It's also a better way to find great talent. Go to linkedin.com slash angel and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. And Embroker. The Embroker startup program helps startups secure the most important lines of insurance at a lower cost and with less hassle. For guaranteed 10% off on premiums and up to 20% depending on quote, go to embroker.com slash angel. Hey, everybody. Welcome to season three of Angel, the podcast. You can visit us at angelpodcast.com. And this is the podcast where I talk to investors in startup companies. And today, we not only have a legendary investor, we have a legend from the technology business. He was the founder of Lotus123. He co-founded the Electronic Frontier Frontier Foundation, EFF, thank you, uh, with John Perry Baller, rest in peace, uh, and also uh, convinced AOL to create the Mozilla Foundation. I've been lucky to get to know Mitch Kapoor and his amazing wife, Freda and partner, uh, over the last couple of years as we were both investors in a taxi company. And we are now on the board of a company called Blockable Together. And it's great to have you on the podcast. Great to be here. Yeah, good to see you. It's a big week for both of us in a way, because 10 years ago, you and I both invested in a taxi company called Uber. What a Long, strange trip it's been. Very much. So to speak. How do you feel 48 hours out from the greatest investment you and I, on a return basis, will have made and will likely ever make in our careers? So actually, this is a big week doubly for us because there's not only the Uber IPO, but we are also at Capo Capital for the first time talking publicly about our results for the last decade. Uh, an impact, both financial returns and the social impact. So yeah. it's a kind of a twofer. I always get into things early. So yeah. as you know, we were in Uber early and I've been anticipating this IPO for a long time. So actually I'm pretty low key about it and yeah. it's, it's a milestone, uh, but we're all locked up as early investors for six months. Yeah, and anyway. The stock market, honestly, the retail investors, they're going to go crazy trying to figure out, am I buying? Am I selling? It's going to bounce all around. So I'm not planning on taking it too seriously, at least for six months to a year to see what the markets do with the stock. Yeah. and Nonetheless, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. But I, like you, yeah. I too am, it's a, I would say, anticlimactic in a way yeah. because yeah. Yeah. it is year 10. Yes. And these companies... Uh, when you were coming up in the 80s, what was it, five, six years they would go public? Sometimes shorter? Yes. Actually, Lotus went public in two years. What? That was very, very, very short. Well, that wow. was interesting. I saw a window. We, mm. It was either do it right away or wait. And right. why wait? Because there was all this junk coming out, junk IPOs. And I said, yeah. the market's going to figure it out. It's going to shut the window. And so it, it was like... And I was in a young man in a hurry, so yeah. we went out quick. Yeah, and but usually five years. Five years, yeah. And it's interesting yeah. now too because you have this yeah. like secondary market yeah. that Facebook started now has gone on, and obviously Uber and Airbnb. And it seems to me that this concept of trading secondary shares has gone supernova. I don't know if you're having this experience where you're getting emailed all week long by secondary market brokers trying to get to sell you Airbnb or buy your Robinhood or yeah. just all over the place. I get a certain amount of that, but look, I keep a much lower profile by design, so I get less of it. But that's all fueled by the fact that there's so much more private capital coming in in later stages mm -hmm. now that didn't used to be the case, many billions of dollars. And it is what permits companies to postpone indefinitely uh, their IPO right. uh, because they can get the financing they need without going through the rigors of exposing themselves to the public. And in doing that, it creates these secondary opportunities yeah. as well. It's interesting. Have, yeah. have you come to a resolution as to the question of, is it better or worse for these companies to stay private longer, having been an early public CEO and been through that discipline and then being an investor in the what is the greatest investment of this past cycle that did choose to stay eight years longer than yeah. 
Lotus as a private company? So I don't think one size fits all. The first right. question is, how much capital does the company really need? Hmm. And all other things being equal, being public puts you under a variety of kinds of scrutiny on the one hand, and on the other hand, the irrationality of the retail market, that there are arguments in favor of avoiding. But an even bigger point is companies are overcapitalized and investors yeah. push them to raise more money than they need and they either go boom or bust. And right. that's not in entrepreneur's interest. That's yeah. not actually in the interest of the public and the economy as a whole. And if investing were really more about creating long-term value and companies that could sustain themselves and do good things in the world, I actually think the heat on how much money they need to raise, how quickly, they just turn down the burner a lot, and that would be a good thing all the way around. Yeah, people seem to be hitting the accelerator before they've added the brake to the car. And that is a dangerous concept, to try to add brakes to a car that's going 150 miles per hour. Well, and... In addition, is the steering wheel really working or not? <laughs> well, there is a steering wheel. We're just not yeah. sure if we actually hooked yeah, it up to the I, tires I, yet. I, I, I was going to say, it's a kind of a growth at any price mindset that is you know, particularly disturbing. It's not a good thing, and it doesn't have to be the case. And we both know lots of entrepreneurs that look back and said, I wish I could have done this in a way that gave me more time. I could have grown the business. It would have been a success. But instead, we overextended ourselves. Yep. And we were out over our skis. And nobody got anything. And it was traumatic. Yeah. I think it's Facebook probably started this. Is The massive returns that Facebook yeah. gave to people in such a short period of time, I think, incentivized this later stage investment cohort to just dip down and say, yeah, it's it's... It's inevitable that the company's going to work. And then I, I remember I had a friend who was one of the major investors in fab.com, which I had passed on investing. I had agreed to invest when it was a gay social network. So that's a good idea, like a gay Facebook. Sure, why not? And then they're like, no, we're going to sell like couches and designer stuff. And they had like a $200 million position and it went to zero. And they thought they were worth $200 million or something. And it was like, uh, no, it's zero. <laughs> right. Yeah, you learn not to take too seriously what you're nominally worth on paper or in your card of certificates because until it's liquid, yeah. it's 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 not real. And all of this is, it's kind of a function of the fact that the VC industry kind of is still operating mostly on a greed first basis where the only thing that counts are financial returns, right? which is not in actually anybody's long-term interest. Right. So capitalism without constraint is actually, in your mind, the not as good for returns. Correct, if right. you take the long-term view. If you take the long-term view. Yeah. So you might be able to get a quick uptick. If you take out some rules, you bend some rules. But long-term, it's probably going to come apart. What what is the what does Cape or Capital do in terms of, and how do you define uh, doing capitalism uh, with a conscience, doing social capitalism. What do you like to call it? What's the right term? Today? Well, <laughs> there isn't a great term because impact investing is now used by so many people in so many different ways that it has become virtually meaningless. Yeah. We talk a lot about uh, having investment criteria about gap closing. We ask, if this business succeeds... Hmm. Is it going to close any kind of gap of access or opportunity or outcome for an underserved community? In other words, does it raise people up from the bottom or does it exacerbate the growing inequality between right. the top and the bottom? And for us, positive impact is always gap closing. Hmm. So our whole investment methodology from how we source things to how we make decisions to how we support companies is not just about the financial side, which obviously that's a huge part of it, it is also about how the company is doing on their mission to close whatever gap they said they were going to, which could be in education, it could be in fintech, it could be criminal justice, it could be housing. It, yeah, it, so it could be transportation. could be transportation. And, and pe right. in fact, people forget this about yeah. the Uber. Uh, the A lot of the good that came out of that company was it 
increase the number of transportation options for co- for communities that didn't have access to them, and it created a large swath of gig economy work that I think is responsible in a lot of ways as a backstop against unemployment. I think one of the reasons we have such low unemployment is that the gig economy is almost like you know, this backstop of, hey, if you really can't find a job this week, you can turn on an app and deliver for Postmates, deliver for Lyft. At least there's this you know, minimum wage job plus a little bit that exists. Is no, that think, how you feel about I it? You, is that the good exactly part? That's exactly right on both points. First, yeah. if uh, you are uh, a person of color in a large urban metropolis, your chances of actually getting an old-fashioned taxi cab to come if you hail it on the street are not good. It's it is close to zero. Close, close to zero. And Uber and you know, uh, ride-hailing services just changed all that. Yeah. I mean, just, you know period. On the work side, it's a kind of interesting paradox. Uh, driving for Uber is, can be, and often is a great second job yeah. and problematic as a first job. As a second job, the flexibility of driving when you want yeah. uh, is incredibly important. If you're a student, if you're a parent, if you are doing things where you have commitments the flexibility it gives you is something that you wouldn't otherwise have and can make all the difference in the world. And I've yeah. talked to dozens of, if not hundreds of drivers over the years around that. On the other hand, and we're, we're seeing this now, we have not sorted out what it means to pay a living wage, make, make a living as a full-time Uber driver. Right. I mean, there's two sets of issues. There's the, the, the take-home pay and there's, there's the benefits. Yeah. And um, I would say the company still has a bunch of work to do on that, but we as a society have a bunch of work to do also because tying benefits to full-time employment, people now recognize this just doesn't make sense. We need to have yeah. portability of some kind. Yeah. I mean, just having a basic yeah. healthcare system yeah. for everybody is so obviously the solution and getting employers out of the business of having this awkward relationship where yeah. people don't leave a company that they hate working for because they can't give up their benefits or limit their choice of their career and where they go to work because that doesn't have the health benefits they need. I mean, that that said, um, you know, Uber has done a huge amount of work to improve relations with drivers, but it is by no means done. And Frida and I, as I think you know, but worth saying here, continue to be quite active in a quiet way behind the scenes in uh, providing advice and counsel. And Frida is on the Global Diversity Advisory Council at Uber to try to nudge them in in the right direction on all of these issues. Yeah, it seems to me, I, I get into it sometimes with some of these Twitter trolls, uh, <laughs> CC, you and I, and every other potential investor or previous employee about this issue. And, One of the things that I think people don't intellectually understand is with the gig economy, if you count the time between jobs as working, then it could dip into low pay. And then if you have a very vibrant time like weekends, all of a sudden you get these Uber drivers and Lyft drivers and Postmate drivers reporting they're making $30 or $40 an hour. But if you work Monday night, the overnight, and you do one ride an hour, maybe you're saying, well, I'm I'm making $8 an hour. And how is that fair? And it... It really is this misconception of downtime in between it. If you're doing a gig economy work, whether you're a painter or, you know, uh, a, a ride sharing driver or any of those other gig kind of work, you get paid per engagement. So, and we're still in this period of experimentation. Yeah. In you know New York, they've capped the number of drivers, and yeah. I think. It, it will play out over the next five to 10 years, but I'd certainly like to see being being able to drive for Uber or one of the ride-sharing companies be something okay if that's if that's the work that you, that, that you have. Yeah, there needs to be, in my examination of the law, having done this in multiple startups where I had freelancers, it's just a big gap between full-time employment yeah. and 1099. And it feels to me like a third category yeah. in between the two where if you just counted up the number of hours or amount of pay, somebody who is a Postmates or a Lyft or pick the gig economy, at 1,000 hours, something should kick in on the benefits or on the time off front. At 1,500 or 2,000, something else could kick in. 
This way, you're not saying, well, somebody working five hours a week should get benefits, somebody working 10 hours a week should not, whatever it is. So there's some sort of new category that doesn't exist that's a kind of a hybrid somewhere yeah. between full-time employment and pure independent contractor that comes with certain uh, certain rights and certain capabilities, and that'll be something that we need to do yeah. socially. Yeah, the government needs to do it because yeah. I had this issue with my own writers at Inside. I had one writer in California who's like, you're, you're withholding tax. And I was like, well, we kind of have to. That's the safest thing to do. And she's like, well, I'm a 1099 employee. You can't withhold my tax. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm now getting the opposite argument. One group of people whose freelancers wants to have their tax withheld because they don't want to deal with 1099 at the end of the year. And then another group wants to be 1099 and they believe it's their right. So you, as the employer, you're stuck in the middle. When we get back from this quick break, um, the report's out. The numbers are staggering. What an amazing uh, return Thank you've you. had on all levels. I want to drill down into K Poor Capital's, Capital's first impact report. This is the first time you've re looked back on the decade. This huh? is the first time we've been going about doing our investing 130 companies in the last uh, eight years. And now we're talking about what our results are to date. All right. When we get back on Angel, the podcast. Oh my God, if you get the wrong hire, it can destroy your business. It can destroy your reputation. You have to hire great people. You know this. And you know that LinkedIn is the greatest place to find top tier talent, especially those that are passive job seekers. What's a passive job seeker? That's somebody who's not actively looking. It's not somebody out of work. It's somebody who's probably got a great job, a good gig, but they see Maybe when they're on LinkedIn, somewhere on the sidebar or in their feed, there's some interesting gig. Working for JCal at This Week in Startups, for example. I found Sir Charles. He has been an amazing director. Before that, a couple of years ago, I had some idiot who lost an episode that I did because he was unqualified. Not only will bad hires hold you back, they could damage your business. I've had my businesses damaged by a bad hire. And then I've had my businesses soar because of a great hire. And 70% of the US workforce is on LinkedIn and the best people are on LinkedIn. We all know that. Nine out of 10 members on LinkedIn are open to new opportunities. And that makes total sense. If you're a smart person, if you're driven, you're gonna keep that LinkedIn profile up to date. You're gonna be on there looking for partners and catching up with old colleagues. You're gonna spend time on LinkedIn. So. I want you to post your job where people go every day to make connections and grow their careers and businesses. That place is LinkedIn. You know that. So hurry to linkedin.com slash angel, linkedin.com slash angel, the podcast you're listening to, and you will get 50, a 50, $50 from jcal, really from LinkedIn, let's be honest, but I'll take credit for it, off your job, first job posting. That's right, 50 bucks, linkedin.com slash angel to get 50 bucks off that first job posting. Do it. Terms and conditions apply, as always. LinkedIn.com slash angel and get that $50 off right now. Hire great people on LinkedIn. Let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay, welcome back. Mitch Kapoor is here. Not Kapoor, it's Kapoor. Thank you. I'm trying to get everybody's like, oh, you know Mitch, Mitch Kapoor? And I'm like, I know Mitch Kapoor. Uh... And he is obviously a partner and the co-founder of Kapoor Capital from 2010 to now, investing in over 130 companies. And let's just get right to it. Here's the chart for those of you who aren't watching uh, and listening. A venture capital firm is um, judged on their IRR, the internal rate of return, the percentage the cash that was deployed increases each year. What is Kapoor Capitals? So we looked from the time period beginning in 2011, which is when we went to 100% uh, gap closing social impact investments through 2017. And our IRR, just as a number, was 29.02%. But here's the meaning of it. There is industry benchmark data, which is collected by third parties by Cambridge Associates, does one set, a pitch book does another set, and they sample representative firms and they say, this is, this is how people are doing. And our results put us in the top quartile, in the top 25% of all venture funds of comparable Impact size. Impact or other. Imp yes, all. 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 So... Uh, You're not handicapping yourself and saying, oh, we're in the social justice impact no, group. Not, no, not, this is across all venture, all right. cutthroat venture capital. Firms. That's right, across all. And I want to underscore, this does not include Uber. What? 
This does not include Uber. This is net of Uber. This if it was Uber, it would be 100% return, because stratos- I did mine. Right, stratospheric. Uh, and that, the wait, reason- wait, why would you well, not? Let me explain why. Because the Uber investment was done 29, 2010, mm-hmm. uh, and that was before we went to all impact. And Got we it. wanted to hold ourselves to a stricter standard mm-hmm. of saying, because we wanted to be able to say to people, look, the investment world as a whole, a lot of it still thinks if you invest- for impact, it's concessionary, meaning you're necessarily giving up financial returns. Right. Well, look, here's our 130 companies, 2011 to 2018, not just one or two, and our performance is top quartile, Right. period. So that's very strong evidence in our view that impact investing is not necessarily concessionary. Hmm. Does... This mean, though, when you do yeah. impact investing, that yeah. you've said no to companies that would have increased and pushed up this IRR even further because they didn't fit into your definition of closing the gap. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. So it could have even been higher if you didn't eliminate one or two companies that might have been outliers. Well, I think as a... Yeah, I'd have to go back and look at what we actually did. But A, two points. I don't see that as any different actually than any other venture firm. Everybody has a list of things that they passed on and regretted. The anti-portfolio. That's right. But Uh, I'm saying the anti-portfolio as defined by they weren't impact. But but let me make the second point, which I think is the more important one, which is we believe that the standards of accountability of business in general are lacking and limited in that the only thing that counts in the venture world are the financial returns. Mm. But all companies have a variety of impacts, mm. uh, you know, environmental, social, on their employees, on their communities. And it's not like most are neutral and some are positive and we do the positive ones. There are a lot of companies with very negative impacts out there that sure, make, the world, make the world a worse place. Yeah. And so it would make no sense for us to invest in one of those companies to boost our returns. But we actually don't think it should make sense for anybody to do that. Yeah. Now, I understand that is not how the world works today. Hmm. But we people who do stuff in technology are always saying, I know ride sharing isn't a thing yet, but we're going to take a flyer on this yeah. little. Th- OK, so part of what we're saying here is that VC ought to reinvent itself to do a fuller accounting of what all of the impacts are the companies that it invests in. And if they did that, then I think the number of things that we pass on that other people take, that would actually, Mm. that gap would close. Interesting. Also, you have a young generation who believes deeply in um, double bottom line, triple bottom line. I'm not sure exactly which terms are the most valid in this, but... I would suspect now that you have planted this flag so successfully that you get high-level entrepreneurs coming to you first, and proprietary deal flow is success in our business. No, that's absolutely right. And that was the most pleasant surprise about this. Because initially, going back almost 10 years, I was honestly a little skeptical. Frida was saying, Mitch, you're turning the angel investing into a boutique VC fund. You ought to be thinking about the impact here. And I was afraid I was going to lose the good deals. Right. What I did not understand then, and and it's really credit to our great in you know investment team, is as our brand became established, entrepreneurs would come to us and say, I'm oversubscribed dramatically, but I want you on my cap table Mm. because you believe what I believe in and I need more investors I'm aligned with because not all of my investors are. Yeah. And I need your voice at. And so we punch above our weight. We're getting into deals all the time that. And that's magical because if if the when a round is oversubscribed, there is two phenomenons happening. One is there's probably a level of quality here that is very high. It's not just that everybody's a lemming. There's probably some signaling that this is going to be a successful company. Thus, it's oversubscribed. The second piece, 
um, is once it is oversubscribed and that momentum starts, it becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. Now they have a war chest to then go deploy, which gives them an advantage over potential competitors and more runway to run more exper experiments. Okay, how else can you actually quantify impact? Because here's another chart. And it says outperforms the TVPI yeah. benchmarks. I don't know what so that is. TVPI is total value of paid in capital. So you sum oh. its ratio. The uh, numerator is how much you've actually taken out in distributions and in, ah. in cash plus the current uh, value you're carrying it out, the, the, right. the, 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 the book value. And the denominator is how much capital you've put in. Oh, this is cash on cash. Yeah. Well, it's not all cash on cash because uh, it's got the illiquid part in sure. it. Sure. But it's sort of, it's value on value. Mm -hmm. And so it's the other measure besides IRR that's commonly used. Sure. And we have a similar, it's actually even a more dramatic result. Our TVPI is three. The Cambridge Associates, which is generally regarded as the gold standard, was 1.86. This is for the 75th percentile. Right. And I should explain... Generally speaking, if you are a limited partner, i.e. you wish to put money into a venture fund that you're just going to park there, you're not going to, you're mm. going to let the, the VCs actually do the investing, you are looking for a fund whose performance is in the top quartile, right. in the top 25%, if, if you can get in, if you of, can get in. of all funds. Yeah, and you so wouldn't want to yeah. be in one of the bottom 50% because yeah. they- Although half the people are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in, and, yeah. and the reason for that yeah. is what you think they're, they're just too crowded at the top. Yeah, I mean the well-established uh, Sand Hill Road firms that have raised many many funds, the Sequoias and 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 and, and benchmarks, uh, generally don't take in any new capital or very little. They just get the same people that were in the last time. Um, and if they give up their allocation, then they don't get invited back. That's right. So, so there is a panic amongst them right, to right. take their slot lest they lose it. That's right. So it's very competitive. So if you're a foundation or a university endowment or a pension fund or a, a family office, it kinds of uh, groups that put money in, into venture funds, unless you're already in, you may find it difficult to get into the top tier fund. How are you using these tremendous returns? Are you, are you planning on raising more money uh, and doing funds at some point, or is it going to be still your? Because I, I think in the beginning it was mostly your money, or a hundred percent. It's it is still uh, uh, our, our Frida's and my money. Yeah, we have two younger partners, uh, Brian Dixon and Ulili Onavakpuri. Yeah. So there are there are four partners. At some point, they will be raising a fund, I think. Yeah. That's their call. We're going to be very supportive of it. So while not today, it's very likely yeah. at the right time. Right. Um, and when yeah. you're looking at these companies, how do you, uh, and we'll get back to this right after the break, I want you to think about how do you determine if they fit an impact business? So give us some tangible examples of businesses that fit and why you included them uh, in your portfolio when we get back on Angel the Podcast. You need to have insurance. I know you're a new founder, maybe. I know you're a serial founder. You're busy. You're trying to get product market fit. Do not let the entire enterprise come crashing down because you're too lazy to get the proper insurance you need. What kind of insurance do you need for your startup? Obviously, you need cyber. What if you get hacked? You need cyber insurance. It's a weird name, but that's what they call it in the industry, cyber. You need DNO. That's directors and officers. What if you get sued? Are your directors, your board of directors, and the people who've invested in you going to get sued? No, they're not because you have proper insurance. And E&O. E-N-O. Errors and omissions. This is super important, and most of your partners are going to make sure that you have cyber, DNO, and E&O. So if your business is just getting off the ground, you want to have the stuff dialed in so you don't miss opportunities with great big customers and partners. You can instantly buy market-leading DNO, EPLI, ENO, and cyber coverage online in minutes, not weeks, by going to mbroker.com slash angel. That's E-M broker, B-R-O-K-E-R, dot com slash angel. mbroker.com slash angel. And you will get 
to save as much as 20% off these premiums. You can get access to the top 50 carriers and their proprietary insurance policies, white glove service, of course, from expert brokers who specialize in high growth companies like ours. You need to have Embroker. Embroker does a great job. I've met with the founders. They're in it for the right reasons. And they're going to simplify this. If you go through regular brokers, they're going to waste your time. They're not going to get you a great price. And they're going to be working you like insurance brokers do. And Broker is trying to make it simple and easy. And they have an elegantly simple product that we're using right now at my companies. EMBroker.com slash angel. E-M-B-R-O-K-E-R dot com slash angel. Go get insured. Make sure you're covered. Do not risk your enterprise. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay, welcome back to Angel the Podcast. It's season three, uh, and this may be our uh, fourth or fifth episode. I'm not sure, but I'm really delighted that Mitch Kapoor is here. Obviously, Kapoor Capital's had uh, tremendous returns, and you've only been at it for a decade, obviously, as an entrepreneur for that, uh, for 20 years. But uh, Dropcam, which was sold to Google, Asana, brilliant. We're both in that one. It's brilliant. Angelist, congratulations. Uber, Class Dojo, Clever, Optimizely, and Twilio, which IPO'd. When you're looking at a company, how do you determine if it fits your impact thesis? And how do you determine if it doesn't? So we really are very explicit. We put our investment criteria right on our website. Yeah. And we have a kind of process for intake because we don't want to give, this is important, unfair advantage to people whom we happen to know or know someone we know. So a warm intro might mean something down the line, but we start everybody out the same way. So there's a little form you fill out on uh, the website. And the point is we literally ask people, well, what kind of gap are you closing? And we give examples of it. So right. we're actually both involved in on the board of and investors in a company called Blockable. Hmm. It's, a good, it's a good example. There are quite a few companies that are doing smart factory built modular housing hmm. uh, to try to help ease the housing crisis. We know we're just not producing enough housing units. The thing about Blockable that was intriguing was they're very specifically oriented towards affordable housing, towards the least well served segment of the market. And that's because it costs. Five hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars a door, as they call it, to build a single unit of affordable housing, and this is just a three hundred square foot uh, module. It, it doesn't pencil out at all, so it doesn't, it doesn't get built. Yeah. So the thesis of Blockable was that by doing what they do, their design, their methodology uh, of doing things in the factory, but also how they do the development and the installation, they could break the cost curve. Yeah. And that, if successful, will close a gap of access in housing for yeah. underserved communities. So we made the investment. Yeah. And it, it's it's wonderful, too. It's been very, I think, yeah. educational for me. And I consider you and Fred as sort of mentors for me since you've been at it for a while and you know much more about the space. But you know, I look at everything just through the lens of how big can it get and mm -hmm. what's the profitability. And it really has opened my mind up to, gosh, you know, when there is a huge opportunity like Blockable... And it can help alleviate um, the pain and the suffering at the bottom. Man, it just feels so great to go to those board meetings. Like the mornings I wake up for the blockable board meeting, I feel like it's like the best of everything I do in my life. It's like I'm, I'm an entrepreneur's entrepreneur to support them. And oh my gosh, if this works, yeah, we it's, could help right. people get off the streets, whether they're homeless or... You know, people who can't, who, maybe they could buy their first home, yeah. make it more affordable for people to own the first home and have equity. Yeah. My gosh. So I would call this real change as opposed to fake change. Yeah. If this works, it is going to make a material difference in addressing a big structural problem that will make, genuinely make people's lives better. And I think it's important to do that, not just to support entrepreneurs, which we do. Not just to get a return, which we do, but to make the point in an era in which there's so much capitalism run amok and gone awry yeah. that it doesn't have to be that way, that there's an alternative. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. It, it is a very interesting discussion right now because we look at capitalism and unconstrained, 
um, you got to see up close and personal Microsoft as an unconstrained organization. In the 90s. In the 90s. Yes. And now we have the unconstrained aughts leading into the teens. And we see what's happening with Facebook, um, Amazon, and Google, uh, and what unconstrained means there. Um, and it's given capitalism such a black eye. And the great irony to me, or paradox perhaps is the better word, is that China has co-opted capitalism to pair it with an authoritative regime, communist, maybe, I don't, I don't know how we like to define China right now, but there's a God King for life, people are, have no freedom of speech and they're living in a, in a police state, powered by the operating system of capitalism. So they get all the benefits of capitalism, but combine it with authoritarianism. And then here in the United States, we have capitalism plus a kind of a, a teetering democracy, but we can't lose capitalism. And I get the sense that some young people feel like capitalism is the problem. Do you feel capitalism is the problem? I understand why in some polls, a majority of young people have a preference for socialism as capitalism. Because if you look at all of the terrible things that have happened hmm. when it's been unconstrained, I, I I think the verdict is is guilty, but hmm. I don't think that means a death penalty. I believe ah. in second chances and rehabilitation, but it's 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 on us to demonstrate that uh, the business can be conducted in a way that's actually in harmony with larger social goals and not exploitative of it. Hmm. And one critically important dimension of that, which we hadn't haven't covered, so yeah. I want to stick it in, is the issue of who gets funded. Mm, let's go you there. Know, who's an entrepreneur? Because I think, look, my favorite saying, you've heard me say this, I'll yeah. say it again, genius is evenly distributed by zip code, but opportunity is not. Genius yeah. and talent. And so we are leaving a lot of people behind, and we are leaving a lot of people who are brilliant and have talent, but not from the right zip code, don't get the right opportunities. They, in our portfolio, we find that people whose lived experience exposes them to the social problems that are plaguing us in a direct way often become the entrepreneurs that see the opportunity to resolve those problems. Mm. But those are the people who tend not to get funded because they don't look like the next Mark Zuckerberg. They don't right. have Stanford. Same, that's right. Nerd. That, that's Aspergery. Right. <laughs> that's right. And the yeah. VC firms that do the investing don't look like that yeah. either. And so one way we've been able to assemble such a great portfolio of gap closing kick ass entrepreneurs is by casting the net widely, mm. is by giving credit to what we like to call distance traveled, not mm. credentials. We like to look at where did somebody come from? What hurdles have they already overcome right. uh, to get where they've gotten? And does that predict a certain tenacity, resilience, and mm. drive that is going to be a factor in making their company successful? Look, I know you come from such a background yeah. yourself. And yeah, and I, you know it's something I've had to reconcile with because, yeah. as much as I felt like an outsider, you know, and I think my conversations yeah. with Freda kind of helped me frame it. Like yeah. she, she said to me at some point, "You think there's people who might have had it harder than you?" And I was just like, at one point in my life, I kind of felt yeah. like no. Yeah. And then I think at this point in my life, it's pretty clear that many, right? Because uh, I'm a white kid from Brooklyn who you know had a lot of people rooting for him, yeah. and I had two parents and a lower middle class upbringing, but there's a bunch of single people who had single parents or, you know, below the poverty level, maybe not in the lower middle class. Um, how do you find those founders? And do you think it's gotten better in Silicon Valley? Because it has been quite an upheaval in the last 10 years, as we've discussed this topic of equal opportunity. We have a couple of minorities or un I guess it's okay to use the term minorities for Indians and Asians who have overperformed a couple of underrepresented groups that are severely underrepresented, Latino or Latinx, I guess is the proper term now, and African-American. Has it gotten better? Do you feel hopeful? Because it does seem like the ranks of VCs have changed massively in terms of gender, but maybe not so much in terms of color. So 
definitely some things are very different and for the better. The conversation about who gets funded, who's writing the checks, the fact that underrepresentation is is seen as a real issue. If you went back 10 years, that wasn't the case. So Yeah, the position was it's a meritocracy, yeah, learn to code. That's right. So so I would say lots of progress has been made in beginning to move out of denial around that. And there certainly are networks now of uh, entrepreneurs of color, African-American, Latinx, underrepresented, uh, that are sort of much more active and helping each other and connected with the investment community and beginning to build the sort of cultural infrastructure that you know really makes a difference in, in the long term. So, and at a firm like ours, uh, which is overwhelmingly uh, a people of color, uh, is very representative of the country as, as a whole, unlike other firms, we actually get much better deal flow because mm. entrepreneurs say, oh, they may have someone at this firm who actually looks like me and who's going to get me and understand me. And they, they, they come in. That makes, that makes a huge difference. Let me tell you what is still very much at issue. I see... Uh, a run of the big VC firms to bring on board, have brought on board their first, and in some few cases, second, uh, uh, women uh, as as partners. Yeah. So that because there was no gender diversity. It was However, weird how. Yeah. It, to the extent yeah. to which the only <laughs> differentiating factor of these new women is their gender, and that in all other regards, yes, have the same kind of elite pedigree. Sure. I don't think that actually goes all that far. It's right. not what we have in mind when we think about diversity and inclusion. So it's a start to have a female partner, Just, but but if they're an MBA from Stanford, who, yeah, yeah, came from an upper middle class, you know, background, sure, um, and that's all that there is. No, that's not. That that really isn't going to help because that that is not what the country looks like. Hmm. Certainly not what the world looks like. And uh, I don't think, therefore, the battle is over right. at all. And um, look, some of this is just hard. I've struggled with this. I myself, coming from you know mi middle class, grew up on on Long Island. Uh, yeah. But I was unaware of the extent to which. I enjoyed a whole set of privileges of stuff I just took for granted. And when I understood other people can't take this for granted, nobody follows me around when I go into a department store no. to buy stuff. That yeah. um, You only need yeah. to be pulled over yeah. doing 92 on the 280 as a yeah. white man to understand your privilege. So Because the yeah. cop is completely yeah. polite to you, yeah. completely yeah. sorry that they pulled you over, and they write your ticket down 15 miles yeah. and say, hey, listen, just yeah. take, take your foot off the right. gas. Right. So... I understand there's a journey for people in Silicon Valley who have had that kind of privilege to uh, recognize it and to take kind of constructive action going forward. It's it's not always, you know, it's not simple and straightforward like flipping a light switch to become an ally. And it's not always obvious if you're a founder and you say, yeah, you're sincere. OK, this company I'm starting, I I don't want to have. Uh, an engineering team that is entirely white and Asian male. Yeah. But you may not be well equipped to go about yeah. doing something different. So we as investors try to be helpful around that, around education, around dialogue, around access to resources so that people who have a will and intent and commitment to change can be supported in that. And I think it takes a lot of that to change the whole system. Yeah. If you're not doing it with intentionality and you're not putting effort into it, it does not occur. That was the lesson I learned. Because right. I used right. to, we, I had a very easy fallback when we didn't have diversity on our panels, which is I would take, I would take the Google sheet yeah. and I would say, here's a list of the women we invited. Here's a list of the people of color we invited. We got 17 no's for this panel. Yeah. And I'm sorry that it's three white guys and an Indian guy or an Indian woman. We tried our best. Yeah. And then at a certain point, I was like, you know what? 
do not, I worked with Jackie and I was like, I, I don't want to send an email ever again where the first five speakers look like me, right? Like we, we have to challenge ourselves that we can't start marketing an event. And I just got called out on it. We happened to put an ad out for our launch festival in Sydney and it was four white guys on the ad. Now we have women and people of color at the event, but the designer just made a mistake. It was, and somebody called me out on it and I was like, oh my God. So I have to go to the designers and say, listen, I know that you didn't intend this, but think about the person who is sure. African-American or Latino or the woman and they see four white guys at the event. They're like, oh, that event's not for me. Right. But if they see two people of color and two women on of the four speakers in the marketing, hey, maybe they'll right. show up and it's up to us to pull them in because I, I actually think there was this... Uh, and you could tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like there was a feeling just five or 10 years ago that maybe African-American founders, Latino founders were just like, they don't want me there, so I'm not going to show up. And then the other side was saying like, well, I'm woke and I, I'm totally open to it. They're not showing up, but nobody's making the actual effort. Right. That, that, that would be an unsophisticated analysis. And I yeah. think an empathic analysis tries to understand how things come across to somebody with a different background and yeah. different set of experiences. And the more you're kind of open to that, and in fact, the more diverse the group of people around the table who are making the initial decisions about, well, how are we going to market this thing? Yeah. You know, uh, it, it, you can actually create, turn a vicious cycle into a virtuous, yeah. uh, virtuous circle. We, we, we just decided to plant a flag and say, we're going to do female founder university and underrepresented founder university. And people can apply to it. And if they feel they're underrepresented in the industry, that has changed everything for the number yeah. of people in our portfolio who are not white guys. Yeah. It has been so transformative for us. We would have 18% female at our events. Yeah. We're talking about free tickets. And then when we said it's only for women, it was 100% women. Right. People need to know that it's for people like them, that they'll yeah. be genuinely feel included, that it's not going to be another negative experience. I mean, this is the interesting thing. Um, on our nonprofit side, Kapor Center, which has a research group that Frida founded and is run by this wonderful woman, Dr. Allison Scott, they've done these studies on the experiences of women of color in tech not just white women. And it's just, if you haven't been immersed in it, the hard time that they get of one kind or another that is just routine standard treatment from us white guy VCs, right. it's just eye-opening. And right. I would commend to people, go to the kipporcenter.org website and pull down the report and, and, and read it that... Um, the fact that you're not, one isn't aware that other people are having, are, are not being well treated routinely, doesn't mean that that's not happening. It just means you're ignorant. And, yeah. and I think we all have a responsibility, whatever choices we make, ignorance is not, never a good defense. You feel like, because you grew up in the yeah. 60s and 70s, I grew yeah. up in the 80s and 90s, you feel like we've gone backwards or made progress on racial relations in America. How does it feel to you? Because we went through so much hard time in the 60s and 70s, so many people assassinated, so much trauma. And now it just, I don't know if it's the age of social media that and video cameras, but does it feel like it's getting better? I mean, this has been part of your life's work, right? Um, I think some things have gotten better. Yeah. And other things just have not and yeah. may actually be getting worse. So, uh, but if you look at just sort of the levels of poverty among uh, African Americans and, and people of color from the 60s to now, you see that there's a not insignificant <laughs> uh, African American middle class. Yeah. And, but uh, if you look at who's been left behind and what groups they come from, and are they beginning to catch up or are they falling further behind on every measure of housing and food and income and work? Uh, and it's not just racial. It's not just African-American and Latinx. There's a very significant portion of the population in rural, rural America sure. and elsewhere uh, that are being left behind. And um, that is worse. 
This mm. is kind of a new gilded age that the that the if you look at ratios of CEO pay to average worker pay or sort of pick your favorite metric, it it's it's just totally gone in the wrong direction. So is there a solution yeah. for that? I mean, you have AOC saying and sort of the New York Times with this ban the billionaires concept, and you know, do you have a problem with Bezos being worth over a hundred billion? He'll obviously, or it's almost certain that he'll give most of it away. You saw your friend Bill Gates give it all away, like. Do you do you have a problem with that polarization of wealth? Should people not be allowed to do that? How do you reconcile that? Because I don't have a reconciliation. Well, yes. I mean, I think that the tax system is not significantly progressive. Right. And I actually think that as far as they go, note my important caveat. Yeah. Elizabeth Warren's ideas about income tax reform and wealth tax. I take them really seriously. Mm. Now she's in a campaign, so I'm not saying we just enact those in, in, into law. But the litmus test, though, for me with a presidential candidate, since I mentioned Elizabeth Warren, yeah. is do they also understand the engine of the economy? Right. Do they also understand that we need innovation? We need entrepreneurs who are not afraid to challenge? Uh, the you know existing regime because that creates more value that creates more jobs and that's where I get worried hmm. that policy proposals are one thing I'd say necessary but not sufficient hmm. and you could kill the goose that you know lays the, lays the golden egg and so partly why we're so focused at Capital Capital on trying to in our own way as best we can demonstrate you can have a kind of capitalism with a heart. You can be about uh, building business with social purpose. Is I actually think we that is what we need. That element in society uh, has to flourish and shine. We're not going to solve problems of inequality simply by redistribution. Yeah. The government is not going to solve the problem. Yeah. But capitalism combined with a conscience, I think, is the anecdote because yeah. these young people are right. radically different in right. how they approach right. business. I see it yeah. every day. Yeah. But uh, so let me circle back to Bezos. Yeah. Uh, I, in a world where the social norms about what was, what business was supposed to be about mm. were where I hope they would be, there might still be a Jeff Bezos, but there'd probably be fewer of them and they mm. might not be worth as much and it would be just fine. Yeah. And I think Bezos is not doing himself any favors. Like he never built like some large endowment or did what Gates did or Buffett did, take the pledge or any of these things. And then he's going around doing this Fakaka crazy 200 city tour and tormenting Detroit and Pittsburgh into thinking they have a chance at getting jobs. Right. When he, everybody knew he was going to bring it to D.C., New York, and places where he wants to be. So we have to, What a bad look. We have to ask ourselves as a society what we're prepared to worship. Right. Because there's a lot of worship of that yeah. and lots of we don't think there's anything wrong with that. And actually, I think that's worshiping the wrong gods. Yeah. It, is, it No, it clearly is. And then the, the people who work at these companies, whether it's Apple Store employees or, you know, Uber and Lyft drivers, I wish they could have participated deeper in the equity and the cap yeah. tables. And it's yeah. just illegal because of the current accreditation laws for those people to buy shares in private companies. Right. If we had the if right now every Uber driver and Lyft driver who was with the service from the beginning got whatever, 10 shares a year some amount they they might have the ability to move from you know being poor or lower middle class up to a different station in life the laws don't allow it so and what i would say is we did the uber investment in 29 2010 yeah. we learned so much about these gig economy marketplaces from uber positive and negative so a number of the subsequent investments that we made uh, we were looking for companies where the workers who are uh, contractors, in some cases employees and others, really had a path into the middle class, mm. had the possibility of rising wages, had benefits. In fact, we were investors in Managed by Q, which was just acquired by, by WeWork, yeah. which really did a great job at that. And I would say if 
the next Uber comes along. And let's be clear, nobody knew Uber was going to be Uber. No. Our, it was our, Lincoln Town Cars. I mean, right. the only person who really knew right. was Travis. Right. He had the vision. Right. Our Our standard of investing would be higher. And we would want to know that there was an active commitment yeah. to uh, working on behalf of all the stakeholders, including the gig workers. And by that test, the original Uber would not have succeeded. Hmm. So we're in the situation of we're about to make a, a pile of money uh, off something that we've now learned we wouldn't do again. Hmm. As you know, we've been working incredibly hard for many years to help make Uber into the kind of company yeah. that we can be proud of. And Dara has done a fabulous job in many, many ways. And, yeah, it's evolved the culture huge. Right, and, yeah. and he and everyone will tell you there's still a long way to go. But I think, I think it really calls for honesty in saying we're still needing to think about how we make our money and what we do with it. But, you know, your listeners should know that we take this money that we're making and it goes back into doing the kinds of investing that we've been talking about. We've been all in on impact, new investments since 2011. I see no sign of stopping that. Uh, it's great to have an evergreen fund like that where yeah. you can just keep investing. You know, it's something interesting. I, I don't know if you saw, I think it was Georgetown put out a position paper or the students and the faculty about reparations. Yeah. And I I remember being in college and this topic coming up and everybody was like, you know, the 19 year olds sitting around were like, well, we didn't have anything to do with slavery. So yeah. what does it matter? And I was listening to the case and we did reparations for uh, Native Americans. We did it for the Japanese who were interned. Have it done the it Germans for, uh, did, did it for it Jews. For Jews in Israel yeah. post World War II. And we haven't done it for African Americans here. And I was thinking, you know, when you see these, how much more evidence does one need to know about systematic racism than looking at the justice system? Yeah. It's just so obvious. It's yeah. statistically been proven that it's just the, the length of sentences, how people are treated is different based on skin color. What an amazing moment it would be, I think, for America, possibly healing, if we actually recognized and the suffering and, and the disadvantage people are at and did reparations in the form of small business loans, education. Like, this would be... You, you're running for office, Jason? I'm not. Uh... It is a term. It's just a ter I just... I hadn't yeah. even considered yeah. reparations for two well, decades yeah. because it kind of fell out you, of the, right. you, the you, discussion... So I would say you're an early indicator among other indicators that that topic has now moved from being outside. The Overton window is moving on reparations. I think so. It's and a discussable topic now that ought to be taken seriously. It's an obvious and one. it wasn't. If you just see, you know, young African men being shot in cold blood or thrown across the hood of cars and smashed to the ground for no infraction or minor infractions... You, you need you need no other evidence. Just that is enough. Right. And if we formed it, see, I was trying to think about how would you make this palatable for guilty white people who maybe would be like, I didn't, I didn't have slaves. Why am you blaming me? Well, There's because because we are indirect beneficiaries Correct. of the exploitation. Correct. So don't focus on the direct piece. Focus on the beneficiary piece. Yeah. That's how you get to a level of, oh, oh, this is starting to make more sense to me. It's such a no-brainer. What, what could it possibly cost? And what, because it, it feels like the one weakness we have in this, uh, one of the prominent weaknesses we still have in this country is that wound. Why it not heal it? it is. It's such an easy layup to just heal that wound right. with a gesture. That is easily for easy for us to absorb into our economy. So I would want to have that conversation with African Americans steering yeah. and really at the table because I think it would be presumptuous, utterly, to do it any other way. Yeah. How does do you know how the African American community feels about it? Is it is it polarizing or is it an obvious discussion? I've never actually. I would. I haven't gone deep I, again, on this topic. I can't. I. I. I don't feel right speaking ah. for that yeah. community. The fragmentary anecdotal evidence I have is that there is a spectrum of opinions huh. uh, about it, yeah. but certainly leaders have made very powerful cases for it. Uh, I think this would be a great 
yeah. platform position for one of the presidential candidates as well, because the Russians knew this is one of our like weaknesses that they yeah. could exploit. It's an exploit. Yeah. It's a bug in our system. It's a virus that they could exploit to create the, you know, these horrible scenes with the tiki torches wherever and the good people on both sides. Like, yeah. That's just a, a, a tremendous weakness in our system. Well, and 2020 is shaping up, no surprise, to be about immigration. Yeah. And I, that's shocking to me how short our memories are for all those of us who, oh, I'm an American, but it was our parents or our grandparents yeah. who came over. And, you know, uh, people like me, there was a 40-year period, we forget this, from 24 to 64, when nobody could get in. Mm. They just slashed the, mm. they, they basically shut the, you know, shut it down, this, yeah. the, the nativist. So it's, it's both race itself, mm. and it's also who gets to be an American of any kind that we have to... Yeah. look at and think about how to make it open and inclusive. Yeah, it's it's so interesting how the debate, so I always polarized. ask I ask people when they have this debate, like, well, what do you think the number is? We of, have of people we should yeah. allow into the country. Ah, yeah. And people don't even know yeah. that it's like, we're talking about a couple of million people a year. Yeah. It's 1% of our population. It's, right. it's, it's so de minimis that it's it's not even worth the amount of polarization around it. And then how should people be let in? Should it be uh, a point-based system like Canada and Australia have? Should it be a lottery? Should it be some combination of them? One of the obvious things is to have some percentage of it be for asylum seekers, some percentage be lottery, and some percentage be merit. Would, would that we lived in a society where it was even possible to have that conversation? That would be the first... Yeah. That, that would just be such huge progress. I, I actually just started yeah. looking it up one night. I'm like, what are we exactly fighting over? How many yeah. millions of people? Yeah. And then how do other places do it? And in Canada and Australia, if you have a PhD, you get like two points. A master's, you get a point. And if you speak the language fluently, you get two points. If you speak it partially, you get a point. So they create a point system where the people with the highest value to the country as immigrants get some percentage of the slots. The people who are suffering under authoritarian regimes get a certain number of the slots and then a lottery for just because yeah. no borders would make no sense. You you would just have everybody migrate to whoever's got the best health care. Yeah. But no, there's well, no so logical that says discussion. That for those countries, rational approaches can be put in place and work. And the the burden is is we are we have a pretty high opinion of ourselves as Americans, American exceptionalism. But yeah. if you travel as I know we both do, and you see what is going on elsewhere. Yeah. You see, we have fallen behind uh, in in so many ways. Yeah. And I just, the denial around that is strong. It's not too late to- No, but to, you have to recognize yes, where you are. That's like right. if you're 20th in education or 15th in right. education, like you can't sit there and pretend you're number one. Right. It, you know, it's like startups. I mean, so I found it, I was just thinking about- Ones who are highly, highly self-confident. That's a good thing, except yeah. when it comes with such denial of not understanding the current predicament that the company yes. is we'll actually this. in. Yeah. It's like yeah. you have eight hours of runway left. Yeah, You're that's... not making payroll that's, at 4 p.m. That's right. That's right. So anyone who succeeds in the startup ecosystem understands that yeah. there's a time for realism. Hmm. There's a time for calling things really the way they are because that is the only way that there's hope to move forward. Yeah. On that note, um, thanks for coming back on the pod. Congratulations on tremendous returns. Thank you. Uh, and for just being a positive force for humanity. It's really great. You know, it's like you're a great example, I think, to a lot of the up and coming, up and coming investors like myself and and people who are trying to figure out what what do we want this to be when this old cohort of VCs on Santo Road are kind of retiring. It's this whole other group coming up right now in their 30s and 40s and 50s who are like, hey, what should this be? And we get to define it, right? We, we can change it. Absolutely. It, it doesn't have so. to be what it's always been. No, and that's, that's the basis of being hopeful. Yeah. So, so thank uh, you for having me on. Yeah.
Thanks uh, to Frida for her, all her inspiration. I know yeah, I've been no, talking be here, but we're a two-person uh, combo. No, I'll, that, I'll, have that her, I'll have her back on the pod. Um, right. Or I'll do a fireside chat with her at one of the events. I think um, going out and speaking at uh, the K4 Center was very special for me. I like your, uh, um, what was the startup? The woman from the startup? Promise. Who, Promise. Yes. What a great startup. Phaedra. This, yes. Phaedra is awesome yes. from Promise. That was a great moment. Yeah. She's like, I don't want your money, Jason. I wouldn't take you as an investor. I was like, well, that's <laughs> now I really wanted. How is Promise doing? Good? They're doing great, actually. They're executing their, this is um, an alternative to bail. Hmm. Uh, it's a way of working with people who are uh, been charged with something, yeah. but haven't been convicted. And how do you uh, help how do you keep them out of jail, which is expensive and where they don't need to be if they're not a risk? Right. How do you build those kind of systems? So they are expanding their pilots, paid pilots to many states, not just out here in, in the Bay Area, but in, in the Midwest, and it's working. Yeah. So they're building something. Phaedra was on the podcast. She was great. Yeah. I think it's going to be, that's a really tremendous business. And then the, I, I read this other story that all the communications inside and outside of prisons are by private companies. Yes. And they're gouging prisoners on yes. top. And it's like, wait right. a second. Right. You know, three bucks a minute. I mean, it's, the only, it's crazy. The only group of people <clears throat> yeah. who have to pay 1998 telecom charges are people in prison. Yeah. Really? Right. So, no, it's it's exploitative. And, yeah, we're investors in a company called Pigeonly that is providing. Oh, really? Yes, an ah. alternative to that. Yeah, yes, that, we've been in that for a number of years. And, they got to solve that. I mean, yeah. oh my lord! Like right. it, you're going to throttle communication and price gouge people who are trying to turn it around. Right. Yeah. Bonkers. It is bonkers. All right. Uh, oh yeah. And if you want to listen to the Phaedra episode, uh, I promise that was episode number eight four three of this week in startups. Uh, Mitch K four continued success. And uh, if you guys are looking for an investor. Uh, Mitch and Fred, that's as good as it gets. Go to the website, kpoorcapital.com. Kpoorcapital.com. And what's the restaurant on the f ground floor? Uh, Agave Uptown. Unbelievably oh. great Oaxacan food. This is in our building in Oakland. Uptown, Agave Oakland. Uptown. Agave oh, Uptown. my Lord. That chicken with the mole sauce, yes. the roast it's chicken and the mole sauce. <laughs> yeah. I literally, I told Aaron from Blockable, I was like, I'm coming to every board meeting, yeah. provided you do it at Kpoor Center and get a reservation yeah. for us after. Yeah. That mole sauce. Yeah. Frida, Frida found this restaurant up in Healdsburg yeah. and persuaded the owner to take an entrepreneurial risk and open a branch in Oakland. Which, yeah, if you're anywhere near Oakland or passing through, you just this is the first Agave stop. Agave Uptown. Agave Uptown, yeah. and you can get it. He gives you, they make the um, <laughs> tortillas there. Yes, on site. So they make the tortilla, the mole, and the, they roast chickens. And it is, like, I feel like leaving the, to go there right now. Right. Well, I'm uh, headed actually, back over there. So now, I, have one now in I know where I'm going to lunch. Hey, Jackie, for staff lunch next week, yeah. I, I want to get that. Agave Uptown. All right, we'll see you next time on Angel the Puppet. Bye bye. Bye.